Well, this fourth Sunday in Lent, where we're continuing, as Helen said, to explore how our liturgy expresses or tells us or reflects back to us something of our identity. So today we are going, we've got to the part where we're talking about the words of the Eucharist, the enacting of the Eucharist, that last supper of Jesus with his closest friends of bread and wine, of sharing and being sent. Some years ago, when I was in parish ministry, I was asked whether I would host a local girl guides troop. One of the parishioners was the one that looked after them. I know they have a name, I just can't remember it. Because they were doing their religious badge and they wanted me to talk to them about the church, about religious symbolism, about the building and so on. That sounds like fun. I thought to myself, a group of young women, a bit of an exploration of the church and to talk of things I thought I knew about. Things began well enough once the shock of the fact that I was neither grey-headed nor, nor male wore off. Then we went up to the altar area. I was talking to them about some of the vestments. Had to negotiate a slightly curly one about how I could be a priest when one young lady told me that her Catholic priest had told her the Bible said woman couldn't be. And then there was another young woman. I think she was probably 12 or 13, sitting a little bit back, separated from the bright-eyed younger ones. With that wonderful dark scowl that only girls of that certain age can perfect, she looked at me with crossed arms. What is it with the bread and wine, the body and blood stuff? What's so important about it? I mean, it seems like it is the main thing, the most important thing. How can eating the body and drinking the blood of a dead person be so important? It's like celebrating cannibalism. It's so gross. Yay. <laughs> I love questions like that. What on earth could I say? How could I translate? What could I translate? Had I even thought about what she was talking about and the effect it might have in such a way that I could make simple sense of it? Did I really know why it was so important? Where do you begin when a young person says something like that? Especially when you're trying to give it some context of religion and the importance of religion or its significance. To be honest, I'm not sure what I said, but I'm sure it was a pretty big fudge. You know, it's kind of plagued me, in case you haven't guessed. I'm still not quite sure how I would say or where I'd begin to say. I think partly because she was of a certain age and I think there was a bit of vested interest in just being provocative. And partly because it's really hard to explain something for it to make any sense, unless I know she shares my context. From her perspective, how is what I am saying important? How is it credible unless we have a shared context to speak with, an agreed story from which we make meaning or seek understanding? For this ritual we enact stands in the context of, and in continuity with, a very specific narrative. One that says God is threaded through time, is agent in history in a very particular way. A narrative that looks at the world and looks at history, and interprets what has and is taking place in a way to make meaning for those who share the story. Not just to know it and to tell the narrative, but we also assent that what it is saying is real. Without that context, that story, that backdrop, if you like, then the kind of thing we do here is challenging, potentially meaningless, or full of wrong meaning, or full of meaning that's completely not helpful. So where do you begin? Without a context, without that story, that deep narrative, a greater understanding of what we do and why, I think the words we use will simply be that. Of course, a good story well told is always engaging. But we say this story's different. 
This story is about a different way of living and being. This story, as John puts it, is a gospel of light and darkness that we can choose for. We can with words teach the story so it can become known, but how have you and I ingested it? How do we embody and live and communicate the story that we have taken into ourselves and live as if it is true? So in our liturgy, as I said, we have come to the kiss of peace, though you might want to pass on that. It's time to make up. We're approaching the altar now. We are greeting one another with peace as people reconciled, a community of common identity, and we are gathered together. As one, we face the altar. We focus upon it. It is the open table, we say, of God's welcome and hospitality. We bring and offer ourselves. We bring and offer gifts of bread and wine. And we bring a share of our abundant resources for our mission neighbors. The table is laid. Bread and wine are placed upon the altar and all is made ready. We gather and he has spoken our story, the story of God's blessing, provision and presence throughout history. And we give thanks and praise. We hear told the story of Jesus' Last Supper with his gathered friends. We give thanks and praise for what has been, for what is now, and for the hope and promise of what is yet to come. We pray God's blessing upon us and upon the offerings we bring as we remember, we reenact, we name and know God with us now. We break the bread and we pour the wine and we share it food and drink of divine sustenance. We share it with all who find place and welcome at this table. Around this table we reenact, we make real in our time that which Jesus did with his disciples. It is this and more though. We say we take into ourselves in the bread and wine, the body and blood of Jesus the life of this God made flesh and time human being. We who call ourselves, we call ourselves the body of Christ in the world when we do this. But there is something curiously more to this than the action and the word. When we engage in this drama, we do this together. We do not do this, we cannot do this alone. We engage not just with our intellect, we don't just bear witness to something magical happening up here on the altar. We gather around this table to hear a story of identity revealed in the person of Jesus, and we choose whether to take that into ourselves. As if in doing so, we are saying we are willing to be changed and to be and live as Jesus did. What do we know of this Jesus of whom we speak? What might be the outworking of us taking into ourselves the identity? What might it ask of us? Author Roger Haight boldly proposes that in Jesus it is no less than God with whom we are confronted. And Barbara Fian, who many of you I know enjoy, declares that this is a very profound faith statement by which we hold that the Holy One the source of everything that is emerged most fully in Jesus of Nazareth. We hold that in everything Jesus stood for, lived, proclaimed, he was and still is the clearest expression of God's presence in our midst. Our faith proclaims God as the source of perfection, goodness, compassion, mercy and love. And this was made present in Jesus. The divine in Jesus graced and sanctified his humanity, allowed it to make present no less than God. And even as Jesus embodied divinity in his humanity, he challenges you and me and all of us to follow him. Since we too are human, we are called to the truth and the integrity and the holiness of our humanity. The life of Jesus was the presencing, making presence of God. Ours is called that to be that as well. 
So in this Eucharist, we might understand through the Holy Spirit, there are two things at work. Bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, and those we who are gathered become more fully the body of Christ. There is no visible change. The bread and wine retain their appearance and effects. Reference to those of us gathered as Christ's body is clearly symbolic. The effects will ultimately be visible only in the way we live our lives and embrace the new covenant to which once again at this Eucharistic meal we commit ourselves. And that makes sense for those of us who know the story. But what does it look like to those who are outside? Take John's Gospel today. What good fun. Thought I might get out of it. It does include that much loved verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him not, might not perish but have eternal life. And then it continues that without belief in Jesus, you will not receive eternal life. Your choice in or out. For someone without a context or a backstory, who hearing this, there is so much in it that is incomprehensible. What does eternal life mean? And would you want it anyway? If you have no context, why would you put yourself into that kind of story that says you're likely to be excluded because no one explained the rules, much less what the game is about? I wrestled with this text all week because I don't want to hear it as an excluding text. I might have to stall. I'm sure many of you will wrestle with me with that later. But I thought about it, and I wondered about whether it was about exclusion, or whether the writer of John is speaking of his lived experience. For those that are, know a lot about biblical texts, eternal for the author of John is thought to be a way of describing life as lived in the unending presence of God. To have eternal life is to be given life as a child of God. It is near. It begins in the believer's present. So for those with hearts willing, those open to receive the possibility that this is being made real in them in this life, this indeed is made real and experienced. That's the experience of the one writing John's Gospel. Equally though, this same author has experienced or ob has observed that there are those like Nicodemus, because this is who Jesus is speaking to in this text. This is a continuation of Nicodemus coming to him after dark. It's the author's observation that there are those like Nicodemus who want Jesus' teaching to fit what they know, to fit the existing system that has evolved with huge integrity and genuine faithfulness over centuries. A system that expresses the human divine relationship has, has been revealed and continues to be revealed. They want to preserve that and keep it safe because it is so valuable. Those like Nicodemus who are curious, who have a very deep love of God and care-filled integrity, who hear what Jesus says and find his dangerously intimate familiarity something they cannot comprehend. It makes no sense from their context. It is perhaps a step too far. It endangers that which is most valuable. So this one who was writing, the author of John, observes that they retreat from the light of that invitation into intimacy that this author has seen and experienced revealed in Jesus. Thinking we know what we're doing and why. What we think we are speaking is being made real in our time. Made me think of my startled response to that young woman's skepticism. What if her skeptical yet honest interrogation of this ritual we enact has a wisdom we need to be confronted with? What are we doing? Have we become fixed in our ways, insisting by this, telling and enacting of a story in this way, that it is faithful through time, that we are revealing something of God made real in human form? 
Yet we struggle to recognize the intimate familiarity of God made present in our neighbor who is suffering from hunger and homelessness, injustice, rejection, racial, religious, gender, sexual orientation, exclusion. Because genuine hospitality of inclusion might be our undoing. It might make us very unsafe. It might mean we become unfamiliar to ourselves. It might transform us. It might break us apart and pour us out for the life of the world. 